All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's event. So many of you were looking forward to this and asked me questions about what it is like to do dibs and particularly serve the DLA and some quick facts on the screen that I have uh, just to let people know a little bit about the DLA. Uh, they actually last year, 2022, provided more than $48.2 billion in goods and services. And so if you look here at the map, uh, this is Defense Logistics Agency across the board. They have DLA Troop Support, DLA Land and Maritime Distribution Disposition Services, Aviation, Energy. So there's a lot of different organizations within DLA that we're going to discuss today. So I just want to kind of give you a brief overview of the conversation. And now I can introduce my guest, Damon. Go ahead and tell us who you are and tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you so much for having me, Eric. My name is uh, Damon Day Cantave. Uh, I'm a government buyer uh, for Two Lions Aerospace. I've been doing it for almost three years now. Uh, I've done uh, a little bit more than two million in sales. I'm currently attending Florida Atlantic University, getting my bachelor's in business management. Uh, and I am a private pilot as well. And I specialize in uh, aviation parts. Uh, that's what I provide to DLA. Nice, nice. Good stuff. And as always, first of all, let's just everyone let us know who's out there uh, so we can see who you are. Tell us about your organization, what it is that you do. Tell me the city that you're from. And also, again, um, we want to know uh, about your business, right? So what is it that your business does? Or if you have any questions today specifically about DLA or DIPS, those, that's going to be our primary conversation. So let's see who's out here. And again, for those of us joining us, we're going to work at, most of you have heard of Unison Marketplace. Uh, and you've heard of DIPS and the bid board system but it's not quite as easy as Unison to figure out. And so uh, Damon has cracked the code and he's gonna be sharing with us how to do that. So I'm excited about this conversation because I can tell you this, I personally never, never have cracked the code on DLA, <laughs> never. You've cracked plenty of, of other codes, man. I've cracked plenty of other codes. You've got all the, got all the big I've ones all the other codes. Well, I will say uh, I was able to successfully research the information to give you ammunition to do this. So I, I have like pulled out information. I'm like, oh yeah, I can yeah. see where the opportunity is at, but I never spent the time and effort to go in and actually uh, figure this out. Just because like you said, you got to prioritize like where your lane is. And so I like to tell yeah, people- You've got a niche I, down. Yeah, I'm one inch wide and a mile deep. So that's how I look at things. And that's the way, that's why he's the person that I'm bringing on today to talk about it. And Damon, look, you've got a crowd building. We've already got 39 people in the first 10 minutes. Oh, that's so awesome. The more than anyone. I want to see, see this and hear about devs today. So this is super, super exciting. Um, again, while you're joining us, let us know who's out here. Like Charles says, hit the thumbs up button. But more importantly, tell me the city that you're from, your business, uh, what your business is about, and or if you've got a question about DLA or DIB specifically so that we can make sure that we address those questions. So Damon, I understand you do have a, a little presentation prepared for us. I do. I do. Um, and I, I actually, you pulled up that DLA fact sheet and there's some pictures on there that I have on my presentation. I was like, man, he beat me to the punch. Eric's Come on, awesome. brother. What do you think? I'm a professional, man. What do you think I'm doing? I mean, look, I, I got to, I mean, if you want to talk to this, that's fine. But you know, oh no, I've I've, I've got one. I've got one ready. But you're all right. The, you you know, all right. Uh, so while everybody's pouring in again, uh, Malcolm, yes, you came in at the right time today. Uh, do me a favor, uh, Damon. Do you have uh, something that people can contact you? Because I I suspect when we finish today, a lot of people are going to want to know who you are. Want to know how to reach you. Is there an email or something that you want people to send to or a link? Funny that you mentioned that. So I was practicing my my presentation and I was on the uh, I was on the last slide. And as you can see here, can you guys see my screen? And that's it. Hold on. I will add it to the screen. There you are. There, you go. there, there it is right there. There's my my email address. Uh, there's our cage code, two lines, aerospace cage code. A Bravo Papa Echo Two, and anytime uh, anybody's ever getting information from from somebody in the government contracting space, I always say get their cage code, look them up, make sure they are who they who they say they are, um, and then you can find me on LinkedIn as well. And then I, I currently have 
two people that I'm, I'm working with now. I got some web developers. My website will be up in, in the coming weeks, in about three weeks here. But I do have client testimonials readily available um, for those of you who, who will request it. But there's my email. That's my primary form of, of contact. So um, please reach out for, for guidance. I, I want to clarify uh, the, the dark art or the, the misconstrued entity that is dibs for, for everybody here. So All right. Good stuff. Um, now, can you tell us how did you get into this? Well, so we'll give you some background while people are still coming on board. Uh, oh, look, someone says DLA just had an industry event um, yesterday and then today. Back to they did. Yeah, they did. All right. Were you there? Uh, I was I was not. I was actually visiting a, uh, a flight school um, today. And then we had um, we had uh, some personnel changes with our, our shipping, our shipping department. So okay. I was handling that. I was actually doing um, something outside of dibs. I was actually handling the uh, I, I was managing the shipping for the Lockheed Martin. Hey, outside. Hey, yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, look, when you run a business, you got to do all kinds of stuff, right? You got to do what you got to do. You got to wear every hat. Uh, when wear all that. So tell us, so, tell us how you got into it. How far back do you want me to go? How far <laughs> back do I need to go? Uh, so I, I started doing this in, in 2020. Um, I, I always, How old were you in 2020, sir? I was, I was 18. I was 18. 18. I, I Look at that. 18. I, I initially started, I was, I was, uh, I was, I committed, I signed to play football at Western Michigan. Then COVID happened. There was no football. So I came back home to play in an area where the, you know, the requirements were less stingent in South Florida with COVID. And then it just didn't work out. You know, that, that football program was also severely affected by COVID. So I, um, I, I got a job. I was I was working at Wawa. I was making sandwiches, and I was always an entrepreneur. Like in high school, I always had a, had a side hustle. I was always doing something. So I started selling shoes. Um, I was selling shoes, and I was reselling the clothes. I was being kind of a broker, if you will. And then um, my parents started the started the company in in July of 2020. And the craziest story is I had a friend who I I met through a friend of a friend. And I'm not sure if any of you guys are familiar with the movie War Dogs, but that's essentially what doing business with DLA is. And I went to his house to go have a conversation with him. And he's like, hey, man, like, I like your energy. Like, what do you do? And I was like, oh, I work at Wawa, man. I make sandwiches. And then he was like, nah, like, you got to be, you got to, you got to leverage your your charisma. So he was like, go, go do sales, go do sales. And, I, and he was like, do you know anybody that does sales? And I told him about government contracting what my parents were doing and he was like dude that's insane you know the movie war dogs and i was like yeah and he's like that's what you do and i was like yeah I, well that's what my parents do but not me and he was like this the place that i was staying at or the place he was staying at that i had the conversation with him in it was actually the penthouse they shot the movie in it was in the the place where they shot the movie war dogs and he's like that's a sign you got to do it so i went home i told my parents the story and they're like we've been telling you for like three months you need to come do sales with us so i started um and then they were telling me they're like, don't do anything else. Like, don't do anything. Don't pick up the phone. Just, just look through these contracts. Tell us which ones are open, which ones are closed. And I didn't listen. I got on the phone. I was cold calling. I was pounding the pavement, and I ended up calling uh, a, a guy who works at ITT. His name is Kenny Parsich. We're great friends to this day. Um, and he ended up being a, a Saints fan as well. I'm a Saints fan. And he was like, listen, kid, you have no idea what you're doing, but I like your moxie. I like the fact that, you know, you're pounding the pavement. So I'm going to help you out. He gave me, he gave me some information, told me where to go. I submitted a quote and my first contract ever was, uh, it was an IDIQ and it ended up being about a uh, hundred it ended up being about worth 160 grand, uh, and some change. And, um, from, from that point on, my parents were like, okay, maybe, maybe we got something here. Um, and then I kind of, I quit my job at, at Wawa and then I just went in, into this full time, um, started working 35 hours a week on top of school, on top of flight training. And I eat, sleep and breathe this stuff. And since then, you know, um, it's, it's taken off a little bit. And then I've been doing consulting for the past two years now. So I've been bidding, uh, I've been, I've been doing the DLA stuff for about three years and then I've been doing the consulting for two years now. Oh, wow. That's incredible. All yeah, right. funny story. Yeah, yeah, so all right, that's a great story. Uh, and let me tell you, he's actually come on, and uh, I haven't had a chance to hear him speak, but other people have raved about him. He came on some, one of our Tuesday calls, and they gave a presentation, and everyone loved it. And so um, I'm excited to get a chance to hear him speak. But before we start, I got to pay some bills. So listen, <laughs> <laughs> I got to pay the bills. Don't forget, our summit's coming up October the 12th. 
VIP I session. Be attending. I will be attending. Okay, excellent. He will be there. Uh, maybe he'll do a DLA session with some of you folks who attend. Uh, make sure you come. It's at the Hotel Intercontinental. Very excited. Uh, we're going to have people from D.C. I've already confirmed National Institute of Health is going to be there. HHS is going to be there. Uh, we're working on the VA and some more DLD folks as well, uh, in addition to some keynoters. So, again, uh, we are looking for folks that can sponsor. So if you know of uh, organizations that have tried to pitch you services like Dell Techs, Neo Systems, Jameson, any of those software solutions, maybe you have a contact. We are still looking for sponsors and exhibit sponsors and booth sponsors as well. So I did want to say that. And uh, so now let's jump into DLA Dibs. By the way, keep plugging in uh, who you are, who's watching, 63 people online right now. Hit the like button. And uh, let's just put your contact information back up on the screen then real quick. That way, in case someone has to go, uh, we'll show them. And then we're going to walk through an actual illustration of using Dibs and DLA. By the way, if you're just joining us, he said he's done over $2 million in contracts, just FYI. Yeah, and our cash code is here if you want to fact check that. About, yes. So tell them why you have your cage code up there for the people that are just joining us. That um, I, I am a firm believer that men lie, women lie, numbers don't. Um, a lot of times when people provide information in the government contracting space, they they might be you know giving you not the most accurate information. So my my way to counteract that is, you know, just look up somebody's cage code and, and verify, you know, if they are who they say they are, check the numbers. Um, you can look us up on, on GovTribe. You can look us up on FPDS. You can look us up on dibs as well, but just a little asterisk about dibs. Um, the contracts, once they're more than 90 days old, they get removed to make room for new contracts. So if you have a certain amount of contracts that you win within a 90 day period, and then some old ones, they'll, they'll, they'll disappear, but they're listed in FPDS and GovTribe. And anything that has a DC in it, that is a contract that I've bid. Um, or um, if it has a CSM, that is a, a contract that I, I helped oversee. I'm also an account manager. So that is a contract that was won via the account that I manage. All right. Let's do it. I love it. I love it, man. You know, I love, listen, I say kids. I love the kids. Bro. They're awesome. <laughs> Eric, Eric is like, Eric is like trick daddy. He loves the kids. He's always looking out for us. Listen, you know what? By the way, it, it, it's something else that's really funny. So when, when I went to his office to visit him and they were trying to let me tell my story, he wanted to tell my story. <laughs> I read I read his book like four times. I knew it like the back of my hand already. Exactly. So, but. But that's the difference, right? You know, other people have it. I had people say, oh, I have your book. You're like, I read it four times. They're like, I own it, right? See the yeah. difference, yeah. right? That's why you're up here giving the presentation and they're still talking about where they're struggling and why, what, who, what, when, where, how. So, but I'm not gonna knock anybody because everyone here to learn and I wanna give you a time to shine. So take it over. Thank you so much. So I'm going to be going over uh, a couple a couple key principles and aspects of doing business with DLA. So quick overview. Uh, I'm going to discuss you know what is DLA, how does DLA operate, what is dibs, what firms need to know, and importantly, how to accelerate your process, how to win contracts, and above all, how to be profitable while doing so. What is DLA? DLA is the Defense Logistics Agency founded in 1961. Uh, fun fact, they were founded in 1961, but it was actually the Defense Supply Agency. And then a decade later in 1971, they became the Defense Logistics Agency. So they primarily manage the flow of resources. So these are goods, services, energy, um, just resources in, in general. And the agency acts as a global military supply chain manager. So DLA actually has large depots, uh, one in Hawaii, which manages the uh, Indian and Pacific relations. And then they've actually got one in Germany, not too far from Frankfurt, which manages uh, their relationships with countries in Africa and Europe. And then they've got a uh, another base in Florida in my backyard in, at McDill Air Force Base uh, that manages the supply chain for various comm communication operations. So as I mentioned before, a lot of people interpret DLA as like this ambiguous, you know, large entity, uh, but it's really just a network of people, processes, and organizations. And in doing business with DLA, 
one thing that's going to come up quite often or a word that you're going to hear quite often is the warfighter. You know, supporting the warfighter is the ultimate goal. The warfighter are the, the people that work in the various branches of the military and other departments as well, but primarily the military, the people that are boots on the ground or are setting up, you know, our IT operations or, or handling our, our HR stuff. Because at the end of the day, you know, we're providing, uh, we're providing goods and, and resources that affect, you know, people's ability to do their job on the ground. And if people are, you know, if people can't, if people can't get the resources that we're providing, um, you know, that could be the difference between, you know, somebody saving somebody's life or somebody making it somewhere on time. So um, supporting the warfighter is the uh, is the ultimate goal. So this is just a little drop down menu that uh, provides some information as to where DLA is in the hierarchy of the Department of Defense. So at the top is the Secretary of Defense and then the Deputy Secretary of Defense. And then uh, there's a couple assistants and then there's DLA there. And as you can see by the arrows here, uh, they provide the they provide goods and services to the military services, uh, various industrial bases, the entirety of the government. So there's you know stuff like uh, the Department of uh, Homeland Security and TSA, the Coast Guard, other agencies, uh, and then there's chairman and joint chiefs of staff, uh, and then various combatant commands, and then these are various agencies uh, around the world that have different missions that are supported by DLA. How does DLA operate? So DLA actually acts as a supply depot for the military. The example that I like to give oftentimes is DLA is basically like a Costco or a Sam's Club and the Army, the Navy, the Air Force and all those reputable departments are, are basically the customers. And us as firms and as people, we're the people that stock the shelves of the Costco's and the BJ's and the, the Sam's Club. Um, because a lot of people think that selling to DLA, you're selling to the military directly, but you're selling to supply depots that hold the stuff. And then the army or the military then goes to DLA and says, hey, you know, I need 100 bearings for these tanks. Um, and then DLA turns around and says, OK, we're going to issue a solicitation for 100 bearings. Um, we need those to stock our shelves to provide to the army. So DLA is essentially a middleman. They keep track of all the materials and goods and services that these departments request. They employ DIBs as their bid board, which uh, I'm sure many of you know. Um, there's an extensive network of POs and COs. So these are procurement officers and contracting officers. So there's a slight difference between the two. A procurement officer is a subsidiary of a contracting officer. Contracting officers have uh, a bit more authority. They can swipe the card for those simplified acquisitions and those micro purchases. Procurement officers oftentimes have to send contracts and material to be reviewed by product specialists and things of that nature. And uh, a lot of times purchases are made in cyclical patterns. So DLA will purchase certain kinds of material at certain times of the year. I know for what I provide bearings, they typically purchase in the months of February and March. So I know that once January rolls around every year, I've got to be on my A game because they're going to be doing a lot of buying of the stuff that I'm selling. How does DLA operate continued? So as I mentioned previously, most transactions are simplified acquisitions. Purchases are made based on forecast. DLA is compiled of many subdivisions. Um, and I just want to touch on the forecast thing. So DLA actually issues these forecasts and their public information because it's our tax dollars at work. So they have to divulge this info and they have forecasts for a year, two years and even three years in advance. So this is useful for firms that want to, you know, maybe take a look and see it. Hey, do I need to pivot um, and sell something else because DLA is going to cut back on their on their spending? Um, 38 days is the industry average for, for payment, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. There are procedures and things that you can do to get DLA to pay you within two weeks. Uh, but sometimes there are some contracts that require things such as first article tests. So DLA will ask for a sample to be made and then they'll have to test it out. Um, and then depending on whether or not if they like it, they'll ask you to ship the remainder. And then after that, it'll take a couple months for you to get paid. So that's why that industry average is 38. It's not exactly a nice round number. And their budget actually follows the use it or lose it ideology, similar to a lot of the government uh, departments. 
And if they don't use at least 80% of the budget that is allocated towards whatever they're purchasing in the current fiscal year, the next year, the amount of funding that they have will be, uh, it'll be decreased. So they have a very, very large inclination to spend a lot of money towards the end of their fiscal year, which is October or October 1st at the end. So September is when they want to spend a lot of money because they've got a whole bunch of money sit sitting sitting in their bank account. And they're like, well, if we don't spend it, we're not going to get it next year. So this is a, a picture that I included and Eric was already on it. He's beating me to the punch, the ultimate professional. Uh, but this is just a, a breakdown of the different subdivisions. So I primarily work with DLA land and maritime and then aviation. Aviation the most uh, for the bearings. I provide a lot of bearings for aviation weapon systems. And then land and maritime, I provide landing gear and struts and things like that um, for, for different like naval carriers, like uh, F-22s that land on the carriers and then tanks and things like that. So that has to do with the land and maritime. And then every now and again, I'll do a little bit of work with DLA troop support. So this is these are typically commercial off the shelf items, stuff that you can find on like Google or Amazon, like washers and things like that, that just need to be stocked. Uh, and then DLA distribution, these are actually very specialized things, things that need to get manufactured. Um, so things that will have a long lead time. Uh, they, they handle all this because, you know, they distribute, they do a lot of the FMS, the foreign military sales. So the stuff that goes to, um, you know, Taiwan or Ukraine or is going to the base in Germany and things like that. So DLA distribution handles a lot of that. What is DIBS? DIBS is the DLA internet bid board system. So it is actually the conduit between firms and DLA. So this is basically how, you know, a, a Joe Blow on the street can, can interact with the large entity that is DLA. And this is where awarded contracts and open solicitations are listed. And I just want to make a, a little footnote here that there's a difference between solicitations and contracts. A solicitation is what DLA issues when they're looking for an RFQ. They're looking for firms to uh, submit a quote. A contract is an awarded legally binding agreement between DLA and a firm. So that legally binding agreement states, you know, as a firm, you're going to provide, you know, X. All right. And it looks like he had a problem with his computer. Um, looks like we lost him and he's coming back on. Um, so while we are waiting for Damon to get back on, he was crushing it. Uh, for those of you who are just joining us, uh, we are, I'll pull up on my screen. Uh, we are talking about DLA dibs and, uh, he was going through some of his experiences in terms of, um, how he got to the point of doing more than $2 million in contracts. Uh, he works with his parents over at Two Lions Aerospace. And so again, just kind of walking through the process. Like uh, like Aquin Lee said, hit the like button. There's 81 people watching. Uh, and again, we put the information up on the screen. Hopefully, he'll Wait, be I just had a power oh, outage. Am I? That's, I I <laughs> that's okay. I, I I you know I kept the party going. Um, while we're waiting for him to get back up, drop your questions in the chat. Um, I did see uh, Brian says, how do you see opportunities before they come out? Uh, he mentioned the forecast list that DLA has. Uh, so there are forecast lists available for the opportunities before they come out. Who else? What other questions do we have out here today? All right. So let's see. Bearing files, et cetera. Do you have to be manufactured for the quote on such manufactured parts? That's a great question. Uh, we'll find out momentarily when it gets back. I can tell you. Okay. Coming back on. Um, Go ahead. Hold on one second. All right. Uh, let me share my screen. Yeah, I hear you. I put uh, I put the screen up for uh, now. Thank you. Thank so, you. Yeah. All right, give us one second. All right, we're good, we're back. All right, yeah, we're, we're back. back. Okay, good stuff. My apologies for that. Oh, well, well, listen, why, 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 weather. <laughs> uh, That's all right, real quick here. A bit on the question before we jump back into the presentation. 
bearings, valves, et cetera. Do you have to be a manufacturer representative to quote on such manufactured parts? You do not. You actually do not have to be a manufacturer representative. You uh, can have various agreements and relationships with vendors and distributors, but DLA does not require you to have any kind of formal agreement or have anything, you know, written down, um, illustrating that you've been given approval. It's it's free and open competition. That's what you'll hear quite often from them. And they, they harp on that. One thing that I will say, though, um, for new firms, when you do start out, oftentimes when you ask for quotes, you've, you've got to do a good job of figuring out who you're asking um, the, for the quotes for from because they'll be like, hey, are you an authorized distributor to sell this? Or are you an authorized, um, you know, manufacturer? So you've just got to pick your spots and find companies that are willing to work with smaller companies. Okay, uh, someone said, how old are you? How old am I? I am 20. Uh, I will be 21 on July 11th, 7 There you go, 21. He's not, he's not old enough to drink yet. <laughs> yeah, I can't. I cannot go to the gas station and buy a beer. That's right. Someone Does said he have uh, ID or something. Can I sign up for mentorship over a cigar? Uh, currently linked LinkedIn. Uh, I actually want to reach out to um, some some people on Eric's team, Brandon, um, the the maestros who handles all that. I want to I want to get in contact with him about uh, that. But that's my uh, LinkedIn right there. Right here. So. There's this LinkedIn. Uh, I'll drop it in the chat for everyone to follow. All right. All right, let's do it. Uh, we were last discussing the awarded contracts versus open solicitations. Uh, yeah, so an awarded contract is a legally binding agreement between a firm and, and DLA to provide, you know, X, Y, Z goods. And then DLA is going to give you, you know, some kind of compensation. And that typically also includes a lead time in which you have to provide it. And then it also includes guidelines in which you have to, you have to ship the material. There's a way you have to provide it to DLA for them. And it's also the medium for firms to submit RFQs. So the majority of contracts that are won via DLA are done online. Uh, I would say about 85% of it, that's coming from uh, my local PTAC. She says about 85% of contracts that are won or submitted uh, online uh, via the RFQ format. Uh, just a quick little breakdown between RFQs versus RFPs. Eric, I know you're super familiar with uh, RFPs and I'm sure a lot of your, your students are, but RFQs- What, uh, sure, sure. Usually they're less than, they're less than 100 grand. Um, they're more frequent, uh, they're, they are more, they're, they're posted more frequently. The number is between five to 10,000, uh, new solicitations or RFQs are posted every day on dibs. Um, and over half of contracts on dibs either have one bidder or have no bidder. So 51% of them, um, either have no competition or nobody bids on them at all. And they're usually submitted via the website and, 30 to 35 percent of them are automatically awarded so dibs has an algorithm or dla has an algorithm i should say that is comprised of you know your spurs score which is the score that you get as you do business with dla and it tracks you know your ability to ship on time your ability to ship the correct material your ability to be within compliance uh, and then how good you are at providing material in your NAICS code but more importantly in your uh, federal supply class grouping code. That is like the biggest thing. Um, so that algorithm combines and then it examines different offers and it examines pricing and availability. And then uh, it goes ahead and pulls the trigger without any human intervention and awards contracts to firms. Whereas RFPs are typically above $100,000 uh, with DLA and they require a bit more of an extensive process. You've got to fill out uh, some, some paperwork. And proposals can be negotiated. And I want to put a little asterisk next to this because when firms first start doing business with DLA, uh, most times what you see is, is what you get. And if you win an award, there is no negotiating. There is no back and forth. And if you submit a bid, DLA is not going to come back to you and ask you to alter anything. They're just going to take it at face value. But as you get uh, more proficient and you start to build relationships with the procurement officers and the contracting officers, they'll come back and they will negotiate with you. Back um, a month ago, 
I was in, I was out of the country. I was, I was in Portugal and I couldn't get access to dibs because you're not allowed to access it outside the country. And I had made an offer on some, some bearings for $56,000. And uh, she said, Hey, can you update this quote for me? Uh, and I told her I'm not in the country right now, but please take this email correspondence that I, as proof that I've received your request. And she said, can I give you a counter offer of 44,000? I, I came back, uh, I went to 50, 52,000 and then she went to 49 and I was like done deal 49,000 it is so you can negotiate as you get more proficient and you start to build relationships with the procurement officers right like it. what firms need to know so these are some of the most important things and I've actually compiled these from uh, my my dad who's the president of of two lions uh, my procurement technical assistance officer uh, my DCMA, and then also uh, my friend Kenny, who is the head of government sales at uh, ITT Industrial, and they're one of the largest valve and electronic makers uh, in the country, and they've got um, huge agreements with Airbus and, and Boeing. So these are things that they recommend for new firms to be aware of while doing business with DLA. How to read a contract. How Knowing how to read a contract will save you so much headache and Eric always says, you know, you get paid to read in this business. The information is is always out there. Um, it's, it's public information, but contracts contain so much valuable information aside just from, you know, what you're required to provide. You know, there's procurement history in there. There's drawings in there that you can look at to see, hey, do I need to be, am I in compliance with what I'm providing based on, you know, the most recent thing? Um, there's also, there's also requirements of certification that you need to have or certifications that it's recommended that you have for a contract. So knowing how to read a contract just provides you so much valuable information. Uh, and then knowing how to package and, and ship material. The easy part is getting the pricing and then going on your computer and typing in, you know, a couple characters and, and letting the government know pricing and availability. The, the real work starts on the back end once you win the award, and then you now have to interpret the contract and then figure out how am I going to package it? How am I going to be in compliance with the various shipping, the various uh, packaging requirements? Uh, and then how am I going to, you know, use the vendor shipping module? How am I going to use WAF, the wide area workflow um, to, to invoice the government and, and print out, you know, my government packing slips and, and things like that. Uh, so knowing how to package and, and ship is, is crucial. And then Financing, it's its an obvious one, but you know, a lot of things are simple in this space, but not everything is easy. So figuring out your, your financing is, it's, it's a large factor because if you're going to take on orders and you know, you have a great value proposition and you can do business with, you know, some, some great vendors and you can be a, a, a solution provider for, for DLA, you've got to consider you're a new firm. So you're going to have to put up some money up front. Um, or you're going to have to say, hey, can I negotiate? Can I get net 30 or can I get 2% on, on 10 days? These kind of things. And then if you are going to take out loans, you've got to be aware of your, your interest rate and, and things like that. But the largest thing to consider when, when financing, especially as you start to win awards, is you know, what is your, what's your top line budget? Because if you win 10 awards and you can only fund you know, up to 20,000, but they're worth 80 grand, then you kind of have to bid your contracts with a longer lead time so that way you can get, afford yourself the time to package ship get paid and then use your profits and then turn around and, and reinvest that you know our from our own personal experience we had instances where we were winning contracts and we just we couldn't fund you know 50 60 grand right. contracts at a time and we were gun shy almost it was like we had to tell our employees, we're like, yo, don't bid on anything that's more than, you know, 50 right. grand because, because we got to pay for all this stuff. Yeah, I, we got to, we got to pay for the printer. I got to, we got to make payroll. We got to pay for rent. We got to pay utilities. We got to pay for all the software. Sure. And it, it was, it's almost frustrating because it's like the money's coming. The government always pays. If the government doesn't pay, we're, you know, we're, we're the whole world is in big trouble if the U.S. Right. government stops paying. So the money's coming, but it just takes time. You know, that 38 days, a lot can happen in 38 days between the time you get awarded a, a contract and then the time where you're you're due to start packaging and shipping. And then even, you know, a lot of times you'll do business with companies that understand the government contracting space. And we had a period where we were a little, we were working out the financing and the interest rates with, with our, our lender. And we would have companies that would quote us and we would win awards and then be like, 
hey, you just won this award. Like, why haven't you sent us the purchase order yet? And this, we won the award, you know, two weeks ago and we, they're in the right. We should be sending them purchase orders because to them, they're like, normally we win it. So you want it. We want to make the order. We want to get our money out. We have to pay our bills. So, you know, you've really got to be aware of your financing, what you can afford. Um, please be aware of your interest rate. If you're getting, if you're a lender, please be aware of your interest rate because in the beginning that was just destroying our profit with stuff that had a long lead time. If you're doing stuff that, you know, isn't going to be ready to ship and it's manufactured and it's going to take a year to ship it's like, dang, man, we put 30% down on a hundred thousand dollar order and we're borrowing against that 30%. Right. And so you're, yeah, no. your interest rate is just eating away and it's not even monthly interest it's like daily interest and it's just compounding so please be aware of your interest rate um if there are any veterans in here i always say you know go to usaa they're your best friend i wish i could go to usaa um they're awesome and then real quick before you before you continue let's take some questions real quick let's just try to answer the questions get folks out here by the way 93 people watching i guess they really like this session we're talking about uh hit the like button first and foremost and then we're going to take a couple questions. So Brian Lynch says, uh, when he's talking about, he wasn't referring to the forecast list. He says, I've seen some daily opportunities that show in Sam's. They show a day before the solicitation drops. Uh, I'm His first question, how do you, oh, see, opportunities how do you see opportunities today? before they come out? So realistically, you can look at, you can look at Sam and it's typically, a day, like you said, it's only a day before they, they come out. Um, but the best way to do that is developing relationships with the procurement officers and the contracting officers. They will just call you eventually once you build a relationship with them. They're like, Hey, the solicitation is dropping. You've you know provided it in the past. We want you to bid on it kind of thing. But there is, there's not a software. There's, there's not anything that you can necessarily do. Like there's not a, a website that you can go to. Um, you can look at Sam, but that's like 24 hours before, and then you can see it, but you can't even you can't even bid on it. But um, with procurement officers reaching out, what you can do if they tell you, you know, they 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 their ears perk up and they tell you something, you can respond to them via email before it officially gets posted with your quote, your offer, your lead time, and then they will they will enter that in. They will like count that as as an entry like a quote and they might go ahead and award it the day it drops um so that is the best way to do that is building relationships with them yeah, how competitive so. is the bidding process and how do you get good pricing it's it varies based on what you supply so dla uh, purchases five million line items so there's a whole bunch of different things i always tell people to niche down get really good at providing one thing like Eric said, you know, you're only a couple of inches wide, but you're a mile deep. Um, get really good at, at one thing so that way you build relationships with the same vendors over and over. So you get preferred pricing. And one of the biggest things that sets apart the good companies um, from the great companies that are first starting out is being able to read contracts and read the procurement history on them and seeing what it last sold for. Because you can negotiate the price that you get with vendors. Everything is everything in life is a negotiation, but especially when you're doing business with the with the government beforehand, before it becomes an award. So what we would do um, is I would say, hey man, this the government last bought this for you know 250 bucks. You're quoting me 275. Neither you or I is gonna make money on this. Work with me at like 230. And, you know, I'll throw 10 bucks on it for 200 units, make like two grand and I'll, I'll break you off kind of thing. But you really just got to be aware of what it last sold for and then developing relationships with the same vendors. So you get preferred pricing. I have one more question in your first award. Was the funding for the service you provided out of pocket or was that through business credit credit or any outside entity working with aircraft? So we were providing entire, we weren't providing entire aircrafts. We were providing components to the aircraft. Um, I, I'll i speak from my own personal experience, not from my company experience because we had, or my, my dad was providing commercial uh, aviation sales for seven years. So he had, you know, almost a decade of, of business credit um, and he had capital, liquid capital available to him. But when I first started bidding on my own um, prior to me pivoting into consulting, I was do I was doing the funding out of pocket, you know, and there's you can limit your your, your contract size. 
Um, I typically tell people, you know, don't go more than a thousand bucks. Even if you have, you know, a million dollars lying around, don't go more than a thousand bucks because you're going to incur some unforeseen costs just with your first order. And I'm not talking about startup costs, but I'm talking about for your first award ever, like there's going to be a mill, you have to pay for mill pack, which is the labeling software. And you've got to pay for, um, you've got to pay, you've got to pay for the labels. You might have to buy a printer. You might have to buy like an invoicing software. So there are things that come up. Um, so I typically would recommend no more than a thousand dollars, but to answer your question, I paid out of pocket. Um, and I did have good, I did have good personal credit, but as Eric talks about in his book, personal credit and business credit are, are two different things. Um, and it's kind of hard to get a business, a loan for a business like this until you've proven that you can at least fulfill one contract. So for the most part, most of my clients, they all do it, you know, out of pocket myself, I did it out of pocket. I have a buddy that works building and repairing refurbishment. Are these the types of aviation parts that government purchases? This is a phenomenal question. This might be my favorite question that I've gotten while um, given these kinds of presentations. So they, they purchase, this would be considered surplus in the government's eyes. So surplus, there's factory new parts, the factory new material, and then surplus material. I primarily specialize in surplus material. I don't like anything that has to get manufactured because that means there's a lead time. The government will purchase refurbished um, or repackaged surplus, but there's a lot more work that you have to do on the front end to basically certify that what you're providing is up to the government standards. Um, and there are ways that you can interpret, like there are things that you look for when you're getting quotes on the pricing um, to determine if it's up to code because you've got to consider these things are going on, you know, C 130s that are carrying entire uh, like platoons of, of people. Um, these are going on, you know, Tomcats that are used as the training aircraft for, for, you know, various air force pilots. So they're really, really like they're stringent on their requirements. So they do purchase refurbished parts and, and surplus parts, but you just have to do a really good job up front of filling out your paperwork and documenting what you're getting. And then also examining the kind of material that you're getting and making sure that it's up to the government's code. Love it. Good answer. Does Day have business credit? And if so, what was his story starting off getting his business credit started? So I actually don't use a uh, business credit. I do have a business, but I don't, I have a credit card for it. Um, and I, I put like a small balance on it. Like I, I might use it to like pay like my mail pat, like my labeling software, but I pay it right off. Um, that's, that's how I got started. But for the most part, I, I was paying everything, you know, just out of pocket. I didn't want to incur any debt that I didn't need to, if I was liquid enough to be able to deploy capital where, and like not have my head like barely above water, I would do that. Um, but to get my business credit started, you know, I went to I went to Wells Fargo, opened up a business loan when I was 17. Um, and when I was selling back when I was selling shoes and stuff, you know, I, I had my dad come with me and we opened up an account and I was just showing them, you know, transaction receipts of, you know, me selling shoes and stuff. So that was how I was able to get the business credit card. And then I just put a small balance on it, like maybe 50 bucks and I would just pay it off. So that's how I build credit for my business, but um, I don't really use it. I try to keep things out of pocket for the most part. I just got my first DLA contract Friday, shipped off the package Monday. Congratulations to you. You are now in like the 1% of the population. Most people don't stick it out. That's you right. 1%, you heard him? You're in the 1% of the population. That's you were right. actually in like the 1% of the population. So many people start, so many people don't make it to the to the finish line kudos to you um i'd be interested to know have you submitted your your stuff in the invoicing software pi and waf are you making sure that you're getting paid for all the wonderful work that you're doing all right do my favorite demo real quick go jump on your uh, go back to your contact information page let's flash on the screen again for people that are just jumping on we're now a past 100 people on here so uh, <laughs> we're, you're kicking butt and uh they love the topic they love the conversation and I knew I knew that would happen, right? So I mean, we've been talking about doing this for months. Uh, so we finally got together. But uh, I'm gonna put his comp his information back on the screen for those of you out here uh, that are just joining us now. We're talking about DLA and dibs. And uh, go ahead and tell them again about your con your contact information and why you put your cage code up there for the new people that just showed up. 
So this is uh, my primary contact is is my email address, uh, Damon at Namiad LLC. That's my consulting firm. Uh, and I used to bid um, as well. I used to bid with DLA as well, but then I pivoted to consulting. Uh, and I've got my cage code up here. This is actually Two Lines Aerospace. So this is my parents' company that I, I, I worked for. Um, I'm actually the longest tenured employee on the on the government side. People were there before me and then they left. It's not a nepotism thing. But um, we include the, the cage code because... Oftentimes, so many people will give information about doing business with the government. And I really see this in, in doing business with DLA. A lot of people will provide information and it's 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 it, it works in theory, but it, people don't prove it in in application. And people will sell people almost like a, a fallacy or a fairy tale. So you always just want to get their cage code, look them up in FPDS, look them up in dibs or govtribe.com. All three of those are, are awesome. Out of the three of those, I would say, you know, look at GovTribe first. It's the easiest to read, easiest to use. Um, then FPDS and then dibs. Um, please look us up. You know, men lie, women lie, numbers don't. Your cage code is like your social security number when doing business with the government. You can't, you can't fake it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's our cage code. And any contract that you see on dibs, um, that either has, you know, a CSM, that's an account that I manage that I helped oversee that contract, or if it has a DC in the, in the quote number, um, that is one that I bid. So you can go look at all the contracts that I've, I've supplied. And here's his LinkedIn. I'm going to drop it in the chat if you want to follow him on LinkedIn as well. So, all right. Uh, let's see what other questions do we have? And we're going to continue this presentation. Um, Okay, so we talked about credit already, talked about capital. Um, somebody said the uh, invoicing software. What's the invoicing system you're using? So the government has their own invoicing software. It's it's Pi Procurement Integrated uh, Electronic Enterprise. So that's what Pi is. And then within Pi, there's this thing called Wide Area Workflow, WAF, and that's how you get paid. Um, so the moment that you get an award, you can go into Pi. Um, and WAF is actually super easy. I'm actually the guy that handles putting our stuff into WAF, so we get we get paid. Um, you literally you go you go in there and it just asks you some pretty straightforward like rudimentary questions about you know um, when did you ship you know the value of the contract, how many parts did you ship, like did you ship the entirety of the contract? You put in the information as to where it's going. You put in your cage code. You let them know, hey, was this inspect was this inspected at the origin? which is you, you know, your location or the destination. Was this freight on board origin? Did the DLA pay for the shipping or did you pay for the shipping? And they just need all that information and then they go in and corroborate that with their own internal system to uh, figure out how much money they need to pay you. Um, and that's how that works. But for our own internal invoicing software, we use something called Avsite, which is specific to the aviation industry. But um, WAVE is what I typically recommend for clients if you're low on capital and you don't, WAVE is free if you don't want to spend any money. But if you need something a little bit more robust, Zoho is phenomenal. I love Zoho. Um, the only reason we're not using it is because we have a commercial side of our company as well. And we just wanted everybody to be on one software. But WAVE and Zoho are the two best invoicing softwares um, that I've seen for doing business with the government. Okay. One more question and we'll, we'll finish up your presentation. What do you use to manage multiple contracts? Do you use a third party logistics company? How did you handle the logistics? What did you use to understand the packaging and the labeling? Uh, loaded question. So we'll start in the beginning to manage multiple contracts. So we used various, we use various softwares. It's evolved. Um, initially we started out in initially we started out quantum which is a very big thing in the aviation space. Quantum is huge. And then we transitioned to Zoho which we loved. And then Zoho was getting kind of expensive um, for the amount of users that we had. So then we transitioned to Outlook. So you can actually use Outlook to manage your, your contracts. I prefer it. It's the easiest. It's the simplest. And you can go as in-depth um, in creating your files as you would like, or you can keep it super surface level. Do we use a third-party logistics company? It's me. I'm the guy that does the packaging. I inspect the stuff. We used to have a guy that did that, but um, he resigned. So I was doing that before he came, and then he came, and it was great. I got a break for a year. 
Um, and then he left. So yeah, it's me. I'm the guy that handles the the packaging. Uh, I coordinate the FedEx pickups and stuff like that. We're fortunate enough. We have a neighbor in our office complex who has a forklift. So she uh, gets the stuff off the truck and puts it on the forklift for us. Um, I inspect the parts. I receive them. I package them. I take pictures of them. Um, and then I coordinate them getting shipped. I actually just had one contract that was for these critical application safety hinges. So I'm Actually, I have to inspect them at our own our own facility, and then I have to send them to uh, DCMA, which is Defense Contract Management Agency, um, to to then inspect again, and then they'll ship it back to me, and then I have to then in turn ship it to DLA. Um, so I'm coordinating that. And then, what did you use to understand the packaging and the and the labeling? Everything is out there. Everything's on on Google. You know, there are a couple softwares. There's a couple tips and, and tricks that I have up my sleeve that are a little bit more in depth. But for the most part, you know, you can Google these packaging codes. They've been used for years, and you know, a lot of companies like logistics companies use the same packaging code. So it's it's public information. Like I know FedEx and UPS and DHL use some of the same packing codes that DLA does. So a Google search um, is is pretty sufficient. But I do have a guide. Um, that I just finished yesterday on how to package and, and inspect. Um, so yeah, reach out to me for that. I do have a guide that I just created on how to interpret that. All right. So we're going to go ahead and wrap up the presentation and then we'll take some more questions. Where were we? We were, uh, here we were. What firms need to know continued. So the meat of a contract is uh, section B. So DLA contracts, they're, they're itemized by letter. So it's section A, B, C, and D. The majority of the contract, uh, the majority of the information that you need in the contract is section B. It gives you the contract line item. Uh, it tells you the drawings. It tells you, you know, the NSN number. Um, it tells you, it gives you the packaging instructions. It tells you how you have to package what you need to be in accordance with. And that brings me to my next point. Commercial packaging is ideal for new for new firms. So as you get to section B, right underneath, you know, the CLIN, the contract line item, um, it's always going to tell you the packaging data. It's it's right always right underneath there, same place. Um, and you can just look up the packaging codes and it'll tell you if it's commercial packaging or not. And then you want to understand your initial startup costs. So I mentioned this beforehand, how your very first contract, you're always going to incur some costs that are one-time costs. Um, so you just want to be aware of that as you are dealing with your first award. How to accelerate your process, courtesy of my PTAC once again. Attend outreach events. DLA has plenty of free Zoom sessions and forecasts. I was fortunate enough to get to go visit DLA Aviation and attend one of their outreach events, and I got a bunch of great knowledge. So just um, going on their website and looking at their at their scheduled outreach events, the free ones are, are awesome. You don't have to pay for any of the ones that DLA hosts. There are some that, you know, procurement officers might host or things like that, that you might have to pay for, but they're totally worth it. You want to familiarize yourself with their, with their mission. Uh, you want to be in line with the agency that you're working for. So DLA itself is an agency, but it has a whole bunch of subsidiaries. Land and Maritime's mission is different from Troop Support's mission. DLA Distribution's mission is different from DLA Aviation's mission. DLA Energy's mission is different from all three. So you wanna you wanna be in line with whoever you're you're trying to do business with. And then the the next thing, which I think is one of the most important things, is building relationships. You know, it's not a a lot of people who try to categorize business businesses as B two B or B two C or in our case B two G business to government. I completely disregard those. And I'm like, this is P2P, person to person. Developing relationships is the quickest way to accelerate your, your growth. You know, asking questions, um, reaching out to the same people over and over. And, and it's twofold. You want to develop relationships with people in the government and then also people um, that are your vendors, you know, or, or if you're going to use a third party shipping company, you want to develop a relationship with your third party shipping companies as well. And then you want to understand the forecast and, and cycles that DLA purchases things on. Um, they typically issue their forecasts, I don't know, three years out. Um, and then they purchase things in cycles. So I know that for my bearings, it's February and March. And then I know that for my my struts and components, I'm looking at the months of, of uh, April, May, and June. So you just want to familiarize yourself with, with that. 
You want to figure out how you can provide a solution. You want to have a value proposition. Uh, and then you you really want to get in touch with the decision makers. Find the people who are swiping the card for the simplified acquisitions. Find the product specialists that are approving your, your material. And then you want to build past performance. The government is very risk averse. So you want to just get your foot in the door and win some contracts to show them that you're capable of shipping, uh, being in compliance, doing the stuff on time. Uh, and and giving them you know what they what they ask for they're super risk averse but the more contracts that you win the less they bust your chops the less search you have to fill now these days like i just the other day i had a bearing distributor that i'm super close with he told me hey there's a solicitation out for this a procurement officer asked me uh, if i could handle this i couldn't handle the inspection i told them you guys would do it i just sent over the quote and he didn't ask me any questions because We've got, you know, almost a half a decade of, of experience in history shipping the bearings. So I didn't have to fill out any certs, whereas two years ago, I would have had to fill out, you know, a different cert for every day of the week and two on Sunday kind of thing. Uh, and you want to niche down. You want to focus on a product. So get really good at selling one thing. You want to focus on the same FSC code or same product supply code. Uh, and you want to get really good at that. You have an overall SPUR score. So that's your, your it's like a grade that you get for dealing with DLA. And then you have a SPUR score that is in relation to each product supply code. So your overall one is obviously important, but each one that you have for your product supply, that's that's essential. That's crucial. Um, if you're really good at, at, at selling you know, chairs, but you're terrible at selling knives, your overall score might be so-so. But because you're so good at selling chairs, they'll keep coming back to you to sell chairs kind of thing. And that is all I have for you guys for today. All right, good stuff. So let's see. Uh, we're right at the top of the hour. And again, um, we want to do an overall um, conversation about DLA and dibs. Uh, we can bring him back on to go into actual examples. Uh, but what I've learned and my experience of teaching online is that no one wants to go back and watch a two hour video. So uh, we'll take some more questions and then if anything we'll bring it back on to actually walk us through a live example on uh, going through a contract or going through and finding something on dla tips if that's okay with david oh i would i would love to if that's okay with you guys if you guys are <laughs> having, like, i'd love to come back you know so let's let's go ahead and let's answer some questions uh let's see all right is dla strict with buy america terms like all products must be made in america or by a u.s company so there's actually a way to bypass this. Um, this is something that I, I learned with, with bearings because the raw material is so important. There's a couple of ways to bypass it. I wouldn't say they're super strict. They're not as strict as other agencies. Uh, but for the most part, if you're a new firm, you really shouldn't be dealing with anything that isn't being made entirely in America because you're opening a whole other can of worms. That's something, you know, I, I like to tell people, okay, once you have six figures worth of contracts underneath your belt, then you might want to start venturing out into other stuff. And even then we didn't touch anything that was manufactured outside of America on, until we were like deep into the seven figure range. So for new companies, I would say, you know, just focus on stuff that's made in America. Answer. Um, how often do you talk to the government before you win or lose a bid? This is a great question. So depending on what you sell um, okay. and, and how or interact. So depending on what you sell or, or how you're selling it, you know, if you're selling factory new stuff, you'll submit a bid and then the government will come back to you and they'll ask you something that's called a request for evaluation. In our office, we call it a reval for short. So up until the point where you get a reval, you don't really talk to them. But if you get a reval, it's good news because that means you're one of the three finalists. You're one of the three final companies to win a contract. Um, and typically, they'll just ask you for some traceability documents, which is documentation proving that you're selling what you are, sell what you say you're selling. So if you're saying something from Boeing, they might ask, hey, give me something proven that you're getting this from, from Boeing. Um, and then you might have, you know, two or three emails in a chain with them um, before they award it to you. Sometimes they ask me for stuff. I send it to them. I get no response. And then two days later, I win it. So it, it varies. Um, like that one instance where I negotiated, uh, I spoke to her, you know, over the course of two days, but sometimes you submit something and you never hear anything. And then you log in one day and you, and you win. That happened to my, my client recently, just this morning, she won her first uh, award and she's like, I didn't hear anything. I didn't, I didn't get any notification. She just logged into dibs and saw a dollar sign. It was like, that's never been there before. So it depends. 
Is there any special rules we need to know how to handle opportunities that deal with tech docs? So I personally don't deal with, with tech docs myself, even at this stage of the game. We have people in our office that do, but for new firms, you can stay away from them. And like I said, there's five to 10,000 solicitations that get put every <laughs> single day. There's, there's no reason for you to feel like you're backed into a corner and you have to deal with these things. I typically, all my clients, I start them on off on commercial off the shelf items, stuff that you can find on Google, Amazon, Home Depot. My like you gave me some examples in it when I was like tape. Tape, 3M, 3M. I, 3M. I sold my third contract ever was a power strip from Best Buy. Like yeah, stuff yeah. that you can find on, on the internet. We we sold ladders from Home Depot. I've I've sold stuff from Walmart. Like focus on stuff like that. Right. There you go. All right. This is a little different question. Being a manuf being a manufacturer, how difficult is it to become an approved supplier? So that's a good that's a good question. So the difficulty ranges based on what you manufacture and then how badly DLA needs it. And then not only that, how many other people manufacture what you make? If you manufactured some hinges that Boeing makes, DLA is not going to be in any kind of rush to approve you when they're dealing with, with Boeing. But my recommendation for, you know, firms that are manufacturers or have the capability to make stuff is, you know, you might not want to be an approved supplier that can make stuff, but become, there are these things called machine shops. So they're approved to make blueprints that other companies issue. So Lockheed Martin or Boeing or Raytheon or Honeywell might issue out a blueprint and say, anybody can make this as long as you make it to exactly this specification. And the government will issue a solicitation or a request for a quote for that specific blueprint and tie it to a solicitation. So I would focus on being an, a, a machine shop rather than approved supplier, because I know at a minimum, you're looking at nine months to a year to get approved. So I'm still new. What does managed contract mean? Is that where y'all, you and the government interact? No. So when I say managing a contract, I mean, are you, a, are you able to keep track of the initial quote that you submitted? You need to be creating a file of like all the email uh, conversations that you're you're having, you know, with with the buyer, the procurement officer, the contracting officer. You need to be getting all the trace documents, so like the certificates of conformance, the packing slips, things like that. That's managing uh, a contract. And then you also need to be aware of you know where it is in in shipping. Like you need to you need to be able to print out the email correspondence or print out the documents that come from vendors such as like order acknowledgements and and things like that so that's what i mean when i say managing the the contract having problems finding support structures for logistics delivery especially pertaining to DA, dod packaging for items i'm sorry i'm going to read this one more time having problems finding support structures for logistics de delivery i'm not sure if, if you mean support structures in terms of like the actual logistics like palletizing and things like that or if you mean, I think, I think, I think they mean, um, remember how you explained to me when the packages come in, you have to repackage them and send them out. Uh, I think you, maybe you mean like third party people that will yeah, they can do that. And repackage. Right. So there's, there's a company I know of that does it and they kind of have a monopoly on the market share, um, of packaging. And we use them one half of the company or the guy's brother who owns that company is also our consultant in the beginning. Um, and he tried to steer us in that direction. I always recommend the firms do your own packaging in house, bang your head against the wall a couple of times. It sucks, but then you'll save so much money in the long run. And you will also one learn. And then two, you don't have to add that markup onto your, to your price when you're submitting to dibs. So don't look for the support structures for the logistics delivery, become it yourself. I would spend 10, 12 hour days, um, just, you know, reading the contracts and, and watching videos and training videos and stuff like that, um, figuring out how to package stuff. There was a point where it would take me a week just to package and ship one thing. Now I can get like five things out in a day. Just try to do, try your best to do it on your, on your own before you go try to outsource it because it's quite costly because there's a, a large monopoly um, on that kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, and Brian, we've talked about this before. We'll have to come back and do an example of reading a contract. We're not going to be able to get to that tonight. All right. And that's something that you could have a whole, I could teach like a semester long class. <laughs> on 
read yeah. it. On there. There's a lot of information on there. How did you handle the bearing contract when most bearings are made outside of the United States? Uh, actually, the majority of bearings are assembled inside the United States. A lot of the raw material comes from out, outside of the United States, but the majority of them are assembled inside uh, the United States. I, uh, I probably would say I, I fulfill anywhere from four to six bearing contracts a month. Um, and a lot of them come from inside the States. And it also has to do with the kind of material I sell. I sell government new surplus, which is material that um, has already been approved by the government and um, they bought too much of it at an earlier date and then it's back on the market now. So I just turn around and sell that back to the government at a higher price than what they initially paid for. So that's how I kind of circumvent that. But for the new stuff, um, I just, you have to make sure that the majority of it is assembled and there's a percentage based on the kind of bearing um, that you're selling that has to be assembled in the U S and then there's a percentage that can be outside of the U S. So that goes back to reading the contract. Is NIST 800-171 an aspect of dibs procurement? I am not familiar with, with um, um, that's cyber security regulations. Say that again. Cybersecurity. Like, cyber security. Like yeah, cyber security. Yeah. So the, I was actually just talking about this um, with my parents in the car today. So there actually there there is an aspect of it, um, but that would be more so DLA. That like DLA does stuff that has to do with cybersecurity. But dibs itself, dibs is mainly for for goods, not really so much for services. Meaning no, so it's different. So they're saying, do you have to be? Because normally, uh, what CMMC and NIST, your computers, your company computers have to be certified, like that you that uh, uh, I see, yeah, I see, you I see, and I your see. side have to be NIST certified in order to sell. And I, apparently the answer is no because you don't even know about it. So that's yeah, that no, no, you do not. You can do it from like a a, a random Mac at on like a library. So. Okay. All right. So, um, son finally asked a question. As a home based business, because I couldn't use the sharing space, I seem to be having issues with the vendors wanting to work with me. Don't divulge that information that you're a home based <laughs> business. I pro tip when you speak on the phone, say we, say us, say our facilities, our teams, make yourself seem like you're bigger than you actually are. I picked that up from Eric. I, when I was a home based business, I, I, you said you wrote that in a in a book. You wrote yeah. that in, in billion yeah, so dollar. You book. never tell people. You never, never tell people business. Yeah, never ever yeah. tell people that. That say you know our facility located yeah, in New York. Yeah, yeah. Right. us, our depart, our, our department, our purchasing Whatever. people, are yeah. Always make yourself seem larger than you are in terms of your company size. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, someone says, do you offer mentorship yet? Do I offer mentorship on DLA? I do. I that's my bread and bread and butter. I would say specifically on dibs, though. I consider myself a, a, somebody who's very well versed on the subject matter of dibs. DLA issues other contracts in various arenas, but dibs specifically, like the internet bid board system and providing goods, uh, goods on on dibs. I'm a veteran, but I don't have past performance selling items to DLA. How do I start? You, my friend, are in the best position out of every single set aside that there ever was. Um, they actually are prioritizing dealing with veterans more than anything else. If you don't have past performance, I always recommend selling commercial off the shelf stuff, stuff that you can find on the Internet. Uh, Amazon, um, a quick Google search. You know, I my client that just won her first award. She had no past performance and she was just bidding commercial off the shelf stuff and she uh she won her contract like that so um you know make sure that you're logged on on sam you're set up in sam and then go to dibs.com and go through the vendor registration process you basically just have to put in your cage code verify your address they send you a postcard and then once you input the information on your postcard because they need to verify your brick and mortar place they give you a cage code and then you're good to go to start bidding all right uh Naja, what site do you use to find small items like tape pens and papers to uh, Google, yeah, Google. I think, I think uh, now it's today's conversation. We're talking about using dibs, so that's where we're finding the commercial off-the-shelf item to bid. Is what I think she's. So, asking. okay. So to clarify, now now I understand the question a little bit better. So the, the website actually is on dibs, and my response to you would be: go to a website. It's called FSC Code Lookup. 
go look up the FSC code for tape, pens, and papers, and then take those FSC codes and go into the RFQ search tab on dibs and then copy and paste those. And then you will see all the contracts for those items. There you go. Um, all right. A couple more questions. Uh, let's see. All right. Where can we find the DLA forecast? Where can you find the DLA forecast? Great question. So when you go, you can actually just type in DLA.com. Um, or when you're on dibs, if you go to the top left and you click the DLA logo, it takes you to their, to their website. Um, and then they have a, they have a tab that talks about like finances, um, and then for each fiscal year and then, and then the forecast and things like that, but it's on their, it's on their website and it's pretty user-friendly. It's, it's pretty intuitive. Um, it's on the DLA website. I don't remember the tab off the top of my head, but top. It's, it's the information is there. You got to search for it. Okay. We if he has to give you every little aspect of it, you're going to have a hard time trying to bid contracts, right? So it's there. It doesn't know exactly the tab, but it's it's in there. You just it's on their it. website. It's on their, it's on their website. website. All right. Um, let's see. All right. Uh, he already answered this question about his first contract, so we're not going to get into that. Uh, Sun I don't think I answer, actually, I don't think I answered that, that question. First contract? Yeah. Remember you said your first contract that you were bidding? Uh, you start under a thousand dollars. Oh yeah, okay, okay. You want an IDIQ for a hundred thousand? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. All right. Um, Soon you, you had to give you had to give an address and and they they look they look you up. I personally think then you you might be dealing with vendors who might be a little bit above your pay grade at right. this stage yeah. of the game, and you yeah. might just need to focus on stuff that you can get on Amazon, Google, Walmart. Home right, you start off with commercial off-the-shelf things like he keeps mentioning, and then you don't have to worry about vendors looking you up because you just buy it from Amazon, and Amazon could care less where they ship it. Yeah. Best Buy is great, too. <laughs> there you go, Best Buy. Yeah, he said Home Depot. Home Depot's all – we had 150 ladders in our office at one point. We had no conference room because we ordered <laughs> too many. We won a contract for 300 ladders, and we were like, damn, we can't ship them. Or we had to ship them in increments because they took up our entire conference room from Home Depot. Um. Uh, Miller wants to know how do they sign up for your mentorship? How you sign up for your, your mentorship? So, um, email. Shoot me, email. Yeah, shoot me an shoot me an email, um, and I always like to just do a quick consultation. I don't like to just take you guys on blindly because it's imperative that you guys at least like me as much, or if not more, than I like you because you're trusting me. You're giving me, you know, your your hard earned money and putting trust in me. So we can. I always set up, you know. Uh, a quick 15 minute consultation call to figure out if, if we're a good match. So shoot me an email uh, with your, your name and your, and your phone number, and then I'll get back to you uh, about my uh, availability and we'll set something up. All right. This person says, I just finished mentorship. It was great. I had no previous experience. Now I feel very confident going forward. D shout out D he's, he's the man. There you go. All right. Uh, all right. Good stuff. Uh, let's see. Aquin Lee says, thank you, Damon. It's been excellent. Well done. Thank you, Aquin Lee. All right. I'm uh, looking at the list. No one bid on. What should we know about AMC and AMS S S C codes? AMC and AMSC codes. So what I would recommend is you don't want to look at no bid list in the beginning just because that's stuff that has kind of been pushed to the back of the procurement officer's desk. You really want to focus on stuff that was issued within like the last three to six months of commercial off the shelf items. Typically, what I see with no bid list stuff, they're smaller items, but they tend to be like springs and things like that or, or hardware or bolts that have to be um, recently manufactured. Um, and I will be completely transparent with you guys. You know, we try to attack the no bid list. We dedicated, you know, um, a team of two people to attack the no bid list. And it was kind of rough for us. It was kind of hard. Um, to get any traction going on it. We had one of our, you know, our better people working on it. So I I can't, I can't speak too much on it, but I do know that um, if you're starting out, find the stuff that was issued within the last three to six months. All right. I, I see you, brother. I actually, I, 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 I can find a super sticker so you can get this question answered. Damn, so you got to answer. I, I just opened the DLA RFQ and notice they also included a price history for the item they do in the RFQ for. Does this imply whatever price you're quoting has to be similar or cheaper? It doesn't have to be, but if you want to win, it should, it should be. 
there are a couple instances uh, that I get more in depth into with my clients as to where you can bypass that. But for the majority of the time, you want to be usually cheaper. If you're going to be above it, you want to take the quantity into consideration. So little gem, um, the more you buy of something, the, the cheaper it is. The more you, the more units you buy, the cheaper it is. So if DLA is buying 10 units and they sold it or they purchased it for 150 bucks and your RFQ is only for five units, it's okay if you're more than 150 bucks because you're less units. So, you know, you've got to cover your, your costs. So be wary of the quantity as well when you're examining that. But yeah, it usually should be around there or cheaper. One like strategy that I employ is like, if I can be cheaper than the last person while providing a larger quantity, I know my probability of winning the contract is higher. All right, good stuff. And so one more time, uh, I'm gonna put his contact information on the screen. Make sure you do a screenshot of it uh, as well. Uh, again, follow him on LinkedIn, connect with them. Um, and then again, uh, we will come back around and we'll do an actual example. We didn't get a chance to do it tonight just because again, for the sake of time. But I think there's a great introduction uh, and letting everyone know what's out there. And kind of like someone said, uh, where was it at here? I like this comment. It says, thank you, Eric and Dave, for the information. It shows that the future is bright. Love seeing it. So I love it. Uh, good stuff. I appreciate everyone tonight. I appreciate you coming on. And, um, you know, until next time, we'll figure out when to get back together. Right. Thank you guys. So much like you. you close it out and you give the people, you tell them some final words. How's that? Uh, thank you guys so much for, for having me. Uh, I really appreciate everybody taking you know the time out of their busy schedules to, to tune in. And if I could leave you guys with, with one piece of advice, uh, I want to be a realist with you guys for a, a quick minute. DLA isn't a, a get rich quick scheme. It's not something that, you know, you just log in and then you type in a quote and then, and then you win. Um, it's not for the, it's not for the faint of heart, but if you're willing to stick it out, um, and you're willing to get to the other side of it, you know, it can be, it can be super profitable. It took us six months to win our, our first contract. Um, my most recent client who won it, I was able to get her down in, in four months. If you're willing to stick it out for, you know, three to six months of, of, you know, doing the work and, and bidding, you will see results. But um, yeah, it's, it's, you gotta be in it for the, for the long game. But uh, I, I appreciate you guys taking the time to, to listen to me and, and tune in. And I'm grateful and honored. And it's a privilege to be here and speak in front of you all. And, you know, I think that, again, one thing I want to share with everybody, I keep telling people that this is a testament that anyone can do it. If you came on late and you forgot, you didn't hear the backstory, he was working at Wawa's before he did this. So from Wawa's to DLA to being up in front of you and doing $2 million in sales, of bearings to now to jets and planes and um, support vehicles, I, I think that really it shows that um, one, there's no limitations, right? The only limitation we have are those that we place on ourselves. And if you really want some bad enough, if you've got that hunger, you've got that desire, you can do it at any age. Because for those of you that missed it, he's still 20 years old. So uh, I just want to say that because I know as we become older, um uh we have more self-doubt we have more imposter syndrome uh, we're more reluctant to take a chance and to try new things and so that's what we're here is and that's why i've been you know coming on sharing these things because i i've seen uh what government accounting has done for myself my friends i've seen the power and to be able to give that to all of you out here uh really for me is a, is a blessing to be able to help to shape and show people what the future could be like if we were to spend a little bit of time just a little bit. He didn't say. He didn't say, he, didn't say he didn't say like college, like four years. It's like four months, six months. Three to six yeah. months is all it is all it takes. Three to six months. If you're not afraid afraid to fail, and you mean three months to learn Spanish, but I was at it two to five hours a day, like just boom, just at it because, like he said, you know, and they've said this before. If you spend eighteen, what was it? I think it was eighteen minutes a day at something for a year, like you're ahead of ninety nine percent of people because no one is consistent at anything like there's no one's a master at anything the majority of the population so it's very easy to defeat the rest of the world so again i hope that this gave you some inspiration it gave you some hope and uh maybe an alternative path to my stuff because while he thinks this is easy i think my stuff is easy so now you've got two easy routes that you've got to <laughs> decide uh which path to take but 
we want to keep showing you examples of people that are doing this across the board that come from all different walks of life and all different backgrounds. So uh, I thank you for coming up today and look forward to bringing you back here again. And uh, that's all I got to say for tonight. Good night. Peace out, everybody.